what do you see as the, the, the impact of the slowdown of emerging markets on the global economy? Yeah, well, I think that we, we really lose track sometimes. We think of a decoupling can take place, but we all, I think that just like uh, socialism can never really exist in one country, neither can capitalism. And so uh, when, uh, I still think we live in a world in which when a large country sneezes, the smaller countries feel it. And I think whether it's China slowing or the U.S. slowing down or Europe in a recession, that this all impacts what the emerging markets and developing parts of the world do. They, that is, they provide the goods, the manufacturing, oftentimes the resources uh, that are consumed in the north or higher income countries. So I think that it's not surprising that they don't be, they're not decoupled, uh, but I think that what, what is notable, I think, is that investors no longer just see emerging markets as an opportunity, but as really a, a more quasi-permanent part of the diversification of portfolios. What does this signify for global and regional FX markets? Yeah, I mean, it's really an amazing world we live in with regional foreign exchange. You think of it several years ago before the advent of the euro, people would trade a lot of these European currencies, uh, Belgian franc, for example, or the French franc, or Luxembourg, and uh, Spain, and Portugal. And now, uh, with those currencies having become one, I think now we look at other countries, uh, Polish, for example, Poland or Hungary have become much more active. And other countries where there have been restricted markets, especially in Asia, there's been a development of an NDF market to give investors access to those currencies, as well as an increased uh, interest in those currencies and emerging markets that do trade more freely, like Turkey or Mexico or the Israeli shekel. Um, do you see a significance of the, uh, the growth of this renminbi as a trade, trade currency? And, and what are your thoughts on China's aim to turn this into a new reserve currency? Yeah, I'm not so sure how much China really intends on making its currency a major reserve asset. I see, that, I see some steps they've taken, but it's very small and from a very small base. I think that uh, we're not going to see China be a major reserve currency in our lifetimes because the kind of things that it requires are not the things that China wants to give very willingly, uh, greater transparency, uh, letting the markets uh, have more sway over the currency. And when we think about it, it's kind of strange in a way that uh, there's only four or five countries in the world that really believe in floating exchange rates. Most of them don't really believe it in practice. And so it's, it's, it doesn't seem so, uh, uh, so weird that China doesn't want the value of the renminbi to be determined the way we decide the value of these other currencies. Uh, I sort of broke into the industry on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. We trade currency futures right next to swine futures. And it seems to be uh, perfectly understandable why the most, one of the most important prices are not to be determined in such a, such a fa fashion. So I think that one is I think China is reluctant to do the things that are necessary to be a major reserve asset. Secondly, I think it's coming from a very small base. And so small improvement is, is, seems big, but it's really not. Like the fact that Nigeria, for example, or the fact that South Korea, Malaysia, even Japan may have some amount of, uh, of Chinese bonds in reserves. They're very small f amounts, and it's, it doesn't compare. I mean, you think about what, uh, uh, how many dollars are out there. Roughly speaking, I want to say that two-thirds of the world reserves are dollars. And another 25% or so is the euro. That leaves very little space, even on the argument of inertia, uh, so I'd say the biggest country that has moved into as a reserve asset has caught people's imagination in the last year or so. It's probably been Australian dollar. Uh, partly, I mean, more countries, including the Swiss National Bank, had buys them for reserve purposes. Countries that are looking for a higher yield, diversify away from the dollar and the euro, but they're not really going to China as much as they're going to, like, Australia or the Canadian dollar. Can you tell me about uh, BBH's presence at Cybos? Sure. Uh, BBH is a, uh, is a custodial bank. Uh, we use the SWIFT system and uh, transfer payments, and the, uh, it's really complicated the way the international finance system works with sub-custodians, custodians, custodians uh, whole networks of Nostra accounts and things like this. So th uh, these kind of uh, forums, these kind of gatherings are important where different, p different users can come together, and I think that through this like, almost serendipitous nature of these contacts, in some ways it helps, uh, helps like, people to understand best practices or learn from people who might be competitors in some, f in some realms. And so I think these kinds of forms are just part of the, uh, the contact points and the social networking that's important for growing businesses. Are there any key talking points that you're taking away from Cybos? Uh, I guess uh, two things really that strike me from people I've uh, had conversations with. One is the, uh, 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 the interest in internet money. Uh, not just, I'm not just thinking about PayPal. Uh, but I'm thinking really of, of trying to come up with money that's available on the Internet as an alternative to banking, which, say, PayPal really depends on. I think that's one thing. The other thing is really trying to use this uh, new technology and social networking. I was talking to some people over dinner, and they wanted to have a, uh, they offered this system in which you can see the way other people in the club trade. 
and you can follow them if you want. So everything's very transparent on a retail kind of level, while on the institutional level we are more familiar with uh, proprietary uh, knowledge, uh, information about what clients are doing, is a very closely guarded secret. And so uh, here it's really social media turning things that we became accustomed to, turning them on their head.